Formula One has been a hotbed for automotive engineering for decades. F1 engineers are the best of the best. And right now, the best of the best of the best is Mercedes AMG Patronas. Since F1 transitioned to V6 turbo hybrid engines in 2014, Mercedes has won the championship every single year. Some of that comes from a talented driver like Lewis Hamilton, but we've seen other drivers perform very well in the Merc too. Heck, we've even seen other teams copy their car and gain almost a full one second advantage. So what is Mercedes doing differently to make them so dominant? Well, even though their cars change every year, there are some things about the Silver Arrows that stay pretty consistent. So today, we're gonna to look at what gives them the edge. We're gonna break down their aerodynamics, their engine efficiency, and the innovation that they bring to the grid each year. Thanks to Raycon for sponsoring today's episode of Bumper to Bumper. You know, life can get noisy sometimes. Say you just want to take a quick little five minute break, sit in your nice chair, enjoy the weather, and then some dude rolls up in a black Mustang and just ruins the peace and quiet. Jerry, Jerry, it's me, Nolan Ward. Jerry, don't make me get out of this car, man. Jerry. But thanks to Raycon and their everyday E25 earbud, I can just pop these bad boys in and isolate out the Nolan. And what's even better is they cost half the price of those other premium earbuds. So that's pretty awesome. And better yet, Raycon offers a free 45 day return policy. So you got nothing to lose. Go to buyraycon.com slash bumper and receive 15% off your order. My time's up. Jane. Now, before we get too far into this, I want to mention that while we did our research on Mercedes AMG Patronas, we can't say with 100% certainty how they're beating everyone. Because if we could, I'd have a job at Alfa Romeo right now. Frederick, my man, hit me up if you need some engineering advice. I got some ideas. This will be a look at what differentiates Mercedes from the other cars on the field, why those differences might be giving them an advantage, and why other teams just can't shift their plan to match Mercedes. And we're gonna start off in the aero department. Aerodynamics play a big part in F1, and over the years, it's gotten to be a pretty complicated subject. But before we can start talking about what makes the Mercedes F1 aero package different, we first need to paint a picture of what F1 aerodynamics are like in general. Crash course in F1 aerodynamic theory, here we go. Aero on a modern F1 car consists of three main things. The front wing, the floor, and the rear wing. The front wing is where it all starts. It's the first part of the car that oncoming air hits, and it dictates how the air hits the rest of the car. And now the front wing is super specific, and this is why you just can't copy another team's front wing, because it doesn't match up with the rest of the car. So the front wing has got to create front end downforce, sending the air away from the car, but it's also got to channel that air to vital components like the brake ducts and the side pods. And high speeds make the front wing's job even harder. Sometimes a car can go so fast or change the direction of airflow so much that it creates a gap in the layers of air. Some air strays attached to the body of the car, that's the boundary layer, and the rest gets sent over the car. That's what's generating our downforce. And in between, well, there's little gaps of nothing, creating a vacuum, and it sucks air towards it from the nice clean layers of air around it, and that's known as our laminar air. Some of the laminar air detaches and tries to randomly fill the voids, bouncing all over the place. And this is what's called turbulence. Turbulent air is bad, you don't want it. It's unpredictable, it spoils the air's momentum, and it's really, really hard to avoid. Turbulent air is like when you're watching a YouTube video and then the ad comes in. But what if I told you that we can make a special kind of air to fill that pocket while still acting like laminar air? Well, we've got one of those and it's a vortex. And a vortex is a spiral of air, kind of like a tornado. It still acts like laminar air, and if it's shot into that vacuum pocket, it can essentially stitch our layers of air back together. And this is why modern front wings are so complicated. All those little winglets and vanes are creating vortices and channeling air to exactly where the rest of the car needs it. So the front wing is directing air every which way, and one of the places the air has got to go is to the floor. The floor of an F1 car is really important. The center portion is flat for minimal turbulence, but the front and back are curved upwards to give the whole car the effect of a giant wing. The floor has plenty
plenty of channeling panels and little Venturi style funnels to get the air under the car moving faster. So it sucked the car to the ground. And F1 cars even send little vortices down the sides of the floor to act like invisible side skirts to seal all that air in. And finally, all this fast moving air gets to the back of the car and that big old wang talking about two different types of wings now. The rear wing is getting loads of clean air to create massive amounts of downforce to press those rear tires into the ground. The rear diffuser, it also plays a big part in the downforce by funneling air out from underneath the car very cleanly. Even the exhaust, it gets some wing treatment to mellow it out, mellow exhaust. It's like a quiet fart. <laughs> Now the rear wing's main job is downforce, but we already know that downforce creates drag. Just like with the front wing, the air is being redirected and can create a vacuum behind the car that would literally suck the car backwards. That's why modern rear wings have those little slits and cutouts, and that's to create vortices to cancel out low pressure zones. If you look closely, you can actually see the spinning air coming off the top corners of an F1's rear wing. All of this can vary from track to track. At a high speed circuit like Monza, wings will be adjusted for low drag and straight line speed. At a high temperature track like Singapore, the wing angles will be changed to optimize cooling of the engine and the brakes. So that's the basics of aero in F1. But what makes the Mercedes F1 car different? The main difference that sticks out about the Merc is that it's a long boy, like your boy, six foot nine. I'm not six foot nine. <laughs> Having a longer car gives the Mercs a big advantage with aero because they have more real estate to make their aero work. Now, if you need to channel air from the front wing to the brake ducts, and the brake ducts are a few millimeters further back, you don't need as severe of an angle in your winglet to make that correction. You create less turbulence and less drag. It also helps with packaging. The space inside the rear wheels around the back of the engine and the gearbox, air needs to be channeled off the sides of the car to the rear wing. With a longer car, Mercedes can sculpt that bodywork around the gearbox more and channel that air better. And finally, you got the floor. Now, remember how I said it was acting like a big wing? Well, if your wing is bigger, it creates more downforce. Now, all of this is totally different to a team like Red Bull, who has been long hailed as the F1 aero kings. Red Bull cars are short with a high rake to help them get around those tight corners better. But Mercedes technical director, James Allison, says that with the Mercedes lose from that long wheelbase, they make up with the aerodynamic benefits. It's a numbers game, so you gotta sacrifice a little to gain a lot. So Mercedes takes a fundamentally different approach to aerodynamics than most of the other top teams. But the aero isn't what people were so blown away by. Let's look at what blew them away the most, and that's the engine. Since 2014, F1 has been using 1.6 liter V6 turbo hybrid engines, revving over 12,000 RPM and making 900 horsepower. That alone is pretty wild. And what's even wilder is that that's the average F1 car. And Mercedes is on a whole nother level. There are probably a few secrets to Mercedes engines that haven't been released to the public. Maybe we'll find out that they had like a little gerbil living inside one of their turbos spinning it up. And his name is Lewis Hamsterston. One of the things that's often overlooked about the Mercedes engine is hidden right in the team's name, Patronus. Patronus is the company that supplies fuel for the Mercedes team, but not just that, they also provide all the fluids and lubricants for their engine. In 2017, Mercedes achieved 50% thermal efficiency, which is crazy, that is huge. To put that in perspective, the average engine is lucky to get 25% thermal efficiency. Thermal efficiency is a measurement of how much potential energy an amount of fuel has versus how much of that comes out of the engine as usable power. A lot of times that energy is lost to friction in the engine creating heat and good engine oil can reduce that friction. This means that the engine is more reliable. There's less wear on the components and it gets better fuel economy. Now I know you're like thinking, okay, what do I care about fuel economy in an F1 car while it's racing? But it's more important than you think. In current F1 regulations, refueling is banned. Current cars can start the race with 110 kilograms of fuel. And if you drive balls to the walls every single lap, you won't make it to the end of the race. If your engine is more fuel efficient, you can either start with less fuel and be lighter than all the other cars, or you can turn the engine up, burn more fuel, and make more power. There's a good chance that is where Mercedes party mode comes from. If you watch freaking F1, Mercedes have a party mode, and it's what allows them to usually qualify the fastest, because it just dumps 
as much fuel as possible, I'm guessing, into the engine. Mercedes also optimized the efficiency of their turbo. F1 turbos are pretty unique already. They're wired up to the hybrid system so the turbo can charge the hybrid power battery, but the system can also work in reverse. The hybrid unit can spool up the turbo directly. But Mercedes took a look at this separated turbo and they realized they can get more gains out of it. They separated the compressor and the turbine even more. And they put them on either ends of the V in the engine block and they ran a drive shaft between them. This got the compressor away away from the heat of the turbine, meaning it got denser air going into the motor. And that also meant that it had shorter piping to the intercooler. And on road cars, you'd call this a hot side and V configuration. Basically, this means that one section of the car is getting all your hot side and another section is getting all the cool side. That way you don't have any of the hot exhaust mixing with any of the cool air you're trying to send into the motor. With better thermal efficiency, the engine is also running cooler. Now anyone knows or follows F1 knows that Mercedes only weakness seems to be on hot days, but it's almost never the engine that has an issue. It's brake temperatures or tire wear. 2014 was when the new engines came about and it was when Mercedes started absolutely destroying the competition. While running the 2012 and 2013 seasons, they spent their efforts building the car for 2014. So while everyone else was working to catch up, the Mercedes engineers had the freedom to get creative and come up with new radical ideas. In 2018, Mercedes came out with a new design for their wheel. It was a design that channeled air through the wheels to keep them cool and to help control tire temperatures. What they did was add a set of spacers to the rear wheels. This wheel spacer was vented, just like you'd see on a drilled rotor. And the idea was to get more air flowing through the center of the wheel, cooling the rear brake, but also cooling the rear tires. And Mercedes are still finding ways to chase tire management today. In 2020, they came up with their most controversial innovation yet. It's called DOS, and it stands for dual axis steering. And here is how it works. You turn your steering wheel left, and the wheels go left. You turn the steering wheel right and your wheels go right. You with me so far? Okay, great, we're on the same page. Now, you push the wheel in and the wheels tow in. And if you pull the wheel towards you, the wheels tow back out. And this tech is so new that we aren't 100% sure what advantage Mercedes are getting from it. But there's plenty of theories on how the system could benefit a Mercedes team. One hypothesis is that it can help them in the tight corners where they're losing out because of their long wheelbase. Having a car with a little bit of toe in can help keep the car straight and stable at high speeds. But if the car has a little bit of toe out, it can help the car dart into the corners. So say I'm in the Mercedes. Hamilton, he retired. Yeah, he's sick of winning. So I'm snaking my way through sector two at Coda. The nose, diving in just right through eight, nine, and 10. Hard on the brakes for turn 11, and then stretched out before me is the back straight. By the end of it, we'll be approaching 200 miles per hour. But my steering is set up quick and darty, and I don't want that. So I accelerate, the cheer of the fans drowned out by the roar of my Mercedes engine. I go with the G-forces and pull my steering wheel towards me, straightening up the front wheels, increasing stability, minimizing scrub, and maximizing top speed. I like this theory, but it would require the drivers make DAS adjustments every single lap, and that is not what seems to be happening. Where they seem to be using it is during a safety car period. When a race becomes unsafe because of debris or a crash, a safety car will come out to slow the drivers down, and they continue in a parade for a few laps while the hazards get everything cleaned up. The problem with that is that F1 tires are designed to run at high speed. They need heat to stay sticky, and if you're going slow, they cool down. But with DAS, the Mercedes car can adjust the toe so that their tires scrub the track just a little bit. This creates friction, and friction creates heat. So when the race starts up again, everyone else is on cold tires. But the Mercedes, they can drive off into the sunset, getting first place like they always do. I have not seen these yet, so. No! Boost Creeps, hoodie. Who's that handsome boy? Man, what a good looking hoodie. We reworked the logo a little bit. Now it's in yellow, really pops skins that black. We added an arm hitch so you can fly that donut flag. I'm gonna rock mine all fall, all winter. Go to donutmedia.com and get you one. They're probably gonna sell out, so I would get it sooner than later. That's it guys, we did it, we figured it out. We know now why Mercedes is so fast 
as an F1 team. All we need to do is you need to give me $150 million and we can go out and make our own donut F1 team. I designed the car, I'd engineer it. Zach and his roommates, they would work on it. James would be the team principal. Nolan would be the guy that when you crash, he'd pat you on the back. He'd be like, it's okay, man. You did a good job. Okay, follow me on Instagram at Jeremiah Burton. Follow us at Donut Media. Bye for now.